Jesus died and is buried, and then on the third day, they come to the tomb, his disciples, looking for him, and he's not there. They can't find him. What they do find is that the stone's been rolled away from the grave door, and Jesus is nowhere to be found. The grave clothes that he was wearing was in the grave. All that was in the grave, but the body wasn't there. So now let's just kind of think about that for a second. We have some folks in the funeral business here today. If you buried somebody today, and then you go out to the cemetery, you know you watched it. You were the one in responsible for making sure that it was all done correctly. And you watched them put the dirt down and cover up a six-foot hole and not put all the flowers around it, you know, and the tent up and all that stuff. You know it's done. You can go sign off and say, it's done. I watched it. I can okay that. But then you go out there the next day and everything's just as you left it. And then you go out the next day and all the dirt's laying over off in a mound over there. And the vault is open. And the casket is open. And the clothes that the person was wearing are in the coffin. But the body is gone. Now, you, I can get a visual image of that. I really can't get a visual image of a stone in front of a cave because that's not our culture, but I can relate to this. And most of us would have, I mean, what would you do? You'd say, well, somebody has robbed a body. Somebody's robbed this grave. And the family would want to be notified right away. Of course, the folks in business would probably not want to notify them right away. They'd probably be out searching everywhere for this body to find out where is this body, what has happened to this body. Well, imagine if you were one of the relatives and you had come that morning before the funeral director had come out and seen it, and you see that your loved one's body is gone. I don't know about you, but I suspect some people will be blowing up some cell phones. <laughs> There'd be pictures right then, immediately, <clears throat> emailed, texted. We're going to find out where this is. Look at what I'm looking at. And oh, woe to the funeral directors that have to put up with whatever they have to put up with that day. But first of all, you would want to notify people, and then you would want everybody to get on the hunt and see what had happened. You'd be calling the police. You'd be calling everybody to help find what had happened. And that, my sisters and brothers, is what happened with Jesus' disciples. They show up, and the grave is empty. And they immediately want to know what has happened. What has happened? This is not the usual. This is not the normal. This is not what we were expecting. Of course, those that had really followed Jesus for a while would have said, oh, uh-oh. Even in life, he was always pulling stuff on us. <laughs> now what has he done? Or what has he instructed somebody to do to get at us, to really rile us. And I bet during that day, as they searched and as they gathered together to form a posse, to go find out what's going on, and to be upset together, and to console one another, I often wonder, did they actually discuss? Well, you know, he did tell us that this was only for a short time. He did mention, I mean, he told us over and over, but then he never followed through. But maybe this time he followed through. Could it be? Could it be that he really is alive somewhere? Did we dream up this whole funeral? Did we have the wrong body in there? Did, did they just think he was dead and Maybe he wasn't, or has somebody really come and robbed this grave and stolen him away? 
It's a whole different story, isn't it? I can only imagine what they must have been going through. I can't even relate to that. I just can't. No one that I have ever loved and buried has ever been pulled back up out of the ground. So I can't relate to that. That's where we know that Jesus appeared to them and said, I'm alive. Everything's going to be okay. I'm not going to stay with you in bodily form anymore, but I'm going to leave my spirit with you, and my spirit will lead you in all that you do and will live inside of you forever. And because Jesus lives through the Holy Spirit in us, we can truly live. We don't have to just exist, folks. We don't just have to be on life support, although life support comes in handy once in a while. And God will give us spiritual life support if we need it. Some of us have been on spiritual life support way too long. It's time for us to get off of that and start really living because we're just existing. It's time for us to start living. Well, how do we do that? How do we do that? Well, according to the reading today, did you notice it says that if we participated in the death, then we can participate in the life. If we participated in the death of Jesus, then we can participate in the resurrection and then the continual living of Christ. Well, that sounds pretty good to me. It sounds very good to me. What does it really mean today, this story? What does it really mean to each one of us? Because, you know, we say when people die that we, at least most of us say alive before we die, that we don't want our life to have been in vain. We want to make sure that people can say something good about us when it's all said and done. That there can be a memorial, there can be a funeral, there can be a final farewell. And even if we decide not to go that route, that we at least want to have made a difference in someone's life. Well, what about Jesus? Don't you think he wanted to make a difference in our lives? He didn't just want to affect the people that were around him. He wanted to affect people from then throughout the ages. And I'm going to tell you, I think he's done a pretty good job. Because obviously if he hadn't have, we wouldn't be sitting here today, would we? Amen. And there wouldn't be people celebrating today all over the world if he had not affected lives with his. But you see, he really did die in vain to us if, if we have not accepted Jesus as our way of life. Remember last week, those of you that were here, I talked about <clears throat> how when we started talking about uh, becoming a greener nation, that it has to become a way of life. It's not, it's not really that green if just once in a while you throw a piece of paper in the recycle bin, but then you throw everything else in the regular trash. It doesn't, it doesn't mean a whole lot if you if you're never looking for ways of becoming greener, using greener materials. And that's kind of hard because they're usually a little more expensive. But if it becomes a way of life and you want to take care of Mother Earth, then you start learning and little by little, even if you can't do it all in one day, and even if you on occasion forget and go back to your old way of thinking. It's not long before something that will happen that will zap you back into reality and make you start thinking about that again. Well, that's the kind of living I'm talking about. That living with Jesus, that Jesus way of life. That Jesus is living in me, and so therefore I constantly am living. In fact, I... I am of service, my whole life is of service to Jesus because I am no longer, according to our reading today, I am no longer a slave to sin. 
You see, we constantly say that Jesus nailed our sins to that cross. Not just the sins of his disciples right then, but yours and mine. They're all nailed on the cross and left there. And, you know, speaking of resurrection, a lot of people just constantly trying to resurrect the sins in their life. I hope you're not guilty. But if human nature is correct, you probably are at least on occasion. You start resurrecting old sins in your life instead of remembering that they were nailed to a cross and you don't have to be bothered with them anymore. You see, if Jesus is living on the inside, then I'm just as prone to do right and probably more prone to do right than to do wrong. Now, I know some of you grow up in churches where they try to make you feel guilty and they're constantly holding things over your head. And I know people tease about Catholicism to say, you know, they're, that they make you feel guilty and you have to walk around feeling guilty. They're not the only ones. The Protestants do the same thing. Maybe not in the same way, but they do the same thing. There's always God standing there ready to zap you and send you to hell. That's what I grew up with. You do wrong and you're going to hell. That's just it. The end. The end. You got to be right. You got to be... Now I'm going to just tell you, I grew up in the Protestant church and in that Protestant church, they taught us a song when we were children called To Be Like Jesus, To Be Like Jesus, That's All I Ask, To Be Like Him. Some of you are nodding your head. You know that little chorus. To Be Like Jesus. Well, Jesus, they taught us, was perfect without sin. So we could not sin. You better not sin or you're not going to have... Jesus not going to live in a dirty temple. Jesus not going to live in there. Some of you have heard this kind of preaching. Some of you grew up with it. Some of you heard it last week in the church you were sitting in. Not in this one, though. you got to be perfect. You can't sin. And then, of course, we walked around, and after a while we began to think that we couldn't sin. And that we, so we had this pious attitude, which was sinful, but we didn't know it. <laughs> or we knew it and ignored it. Or that we were just sitting around with so many other pious people that we just fit in. <laughs> and we didn't sin. We made mistakes. <laughs> yeah. you Oh, there's a good one. We have come up short of the glory of God. We have come up short. Oh, that's a good one. I didn't even have that one. Thank you, brother. You've been there. You've been there. But now I'm going to tell you something. During my middle school years, I was sent to a, um, a Southern Baptist school. And in that school, I sat on We had chapel every week and several times a week and I, I, I remember some of the theology that they taught and some of the, it's not really theology but just way of living kind of stuff that they taught was so different than what I was used to in the Pentecostal church that we would butt heads sometimes with theology because they taught us from the pulpit that we are born into sin because of Adam and we are all sinners. We have no choice in the matter. We're all filthy, dirty rags. Because that's what the Apostle Paul called himself. Said his righteousness was as filthy, dirty rags. 